Hello, good evening, and welcome. I'm John Lazarus with Stories Matter and DNA Publishing. If there's one mistake I've made in this video series, it's that I haven't told you enough about myself. Any asshole can get on YouTube and give you writing advice with zero credentials. Why should you trust me? After all, I don't show my face and I use a pseudonym, and if you listen closely, I frequently have the faint sounds of screaming in the background audio of my videos that I can't edit out. But the truth of the matter is, there's a lot to be learned from my 25 years of experience as a writer, both from my successes and my failures. In today's video, we'll take a deep dive into the most productive year of my career, and I'll share things I learned about productivity, the elements of fiction, and crippling drug addiction. And if nothing else, you'll be able to identify the warning signs that someone is secretly poisoning you. Let's ink up our pens and put on our writing gloves to prevent pussing blisters on this edition of Stories Matter. Today's video is brought to you by Google. Whatever. We don't even really need this ad, but we'll waste this 30 second plug anyway. Why? Fuck you, that's why. We don't give a shit. You'll use our services whether you like it or not. Sure, our search engine is fucking worthless now, but what the fuck are you gonna do? Use fucking Bing? No, you're not. Eat shit. And buy our terrible other products, too. Or don't. It doesn't matter. The internet's all ads and bots and Russian agents and everything's unusable now, but are you gonna do something about it? Keep fucking watching YouTube, you worthless piece of shit. Let me set the scene. The year is 2008. The global financial crisis had displaced thousands of hardworking investment bankers and hedge fund managers. America was well on its way to electing its first half-Kenyan president. And Hawthorne had shocked the world and won the AFL Grand Final. This was about one decade into my career. As fans of the channel will know, the very beginning of my career was bumpy. I made the rookie mistake of working with the first publisher who would have me, a fringe publisher with no offices who wanted to publish my series of novels about serial killers who brutalize women for all the wrong reasons. And then my second publisher, while more reputable, had set it up so I lost money on every book I sold. Then, in 2003, into my life came Tabitha Cartwright. Because of certain legal agreements, I can't go into too many specifics about our relationship, but despite how things ended, it was certainly the most fruitful collaboration of my career. She was, just to give an example, the first person who told me I shouldn't endow all my female characters with double D breasts. I was finally able to write a book that sold more than a thousand copies. And I grew immensely as a writer, with a much better understanding of narrative convention, how to market my books and myself, and how to speak to publishers. Soon I was churning out books like L. Ron Hubbard possessed by the spirit of Xenu himself. In the final year, 2008, I wrote 51. Here's what I learned. Lesson 1. It all starts with a strict routine. As a writer, it's not enough to want it. You can say you're determined all you want. The junkies at the support group I've joined under false pretenses to get ideas for my writing say it all the time before they inevitably relapse. But having a strict routine enforces determination. You can see my video on my writing routine here. To paraphrase, you should design a routine that provides the following things. Time to write. Ways to make writing your happy place. Time to edit and... Lesson 2. Punishment for not following your routine. You can't let life get in the way of a good idea. Think of what our world might be like if Einstein hadn't been absolutely revolting to his wife so he could focus on his work. But it's not enough to miss recitals or funerals and stay home to write. You need a concrete method for making sure you meet your deadlines. Some people might hook up car batteries to their body and their alarm clock, but I'm not a science guy. As I told you in my writer's block video, the most effective way to stick to a deadline is to hire ex-cons to inflict physical punishment for missing deadlines. I got the idea from my loan shark, and it worked wonders. Make sure you set clear rules and boundaries. Obviously, you don't want your fingers broken, or that would defeat the whole purpose. But if they rough your face up just enough to avoid needing to see the doctor, you'll find yourself motivated. Lesson 3. Make sure your POV is consistent. Lots of writers worry about plot holes, or creating snappy dialogue. But almost nobody realizes the importance of having a consistent POV that serves a specific function. Maybe it was because I was writing 15,000 words every day and only getting up when I hallucinated that somebody was knocking on my door, but I would slide between third-person omniscient and third-person limited often. Lesson 4. 
Big ideas are more important than details or spelling errors or turning in your final manuscript on the back of horse race pick slips. Whether you're writing for 30 minutes a day after work or you're writing all night just to avoid your sleep paralysis demon, keep in mind that publishers and consumers care about the big picture. A unique hook will draw more readers than a completely unfinished chapter will push them away. At least with the latter, you can disguise it as a metaphor. Lesson 5. There are a lot of legal amphetamines. So after book 30, even I was a little surprised by my own productivity. I mean, I knew story structure in and out, and I also didn't have to cook or clean or bathe myself because Tabitha hired a maid to do all that for me. I was always driven, and I never had the most normal sleep patterns, but it did seem strange to be awake for 72 straight hours and then crash for the following 16. And it turns out the aspirin the maid was giving me was actually an amphetamine responsible for my loss of sleep. When I confronted Tabitha, she said it was legal, took me to the pharmacy where she bought it, and said it was no different than putting her dog's heartworm medication in his biscuits. If I wasn't so horribly addicted by that point, I probably would have gotten mad. Lesson 6. Sleep deprivation can lead to memory loss. Just like a porn star or a calculus teacher, a writer needs to know their limits. Mine were thrust upon me. Books 32 to 47 are all lost to memory. The only evidence I have of those few months is the final product of 15 very poorly written novels and a very terrible Bernie Madoff Halloween costume. I'm pretty sure I stopped taking the drug at some point during this period only due to the fact that I'm not dead. To this day, I'm still not sure if it was through sheer willpower or if Tabitha simply realized my books weren't selling enough to pay for the pills, the maid, and the baby I somehow put inside her. Anyway, if you're going to write 51 books this year, make sure to take care of your physical and mental well-being. That's all for today. Please like and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll leave you with this week's Author Quote of the Week. See you on the next one.